interviewing the leading private equity executives and unlocking the secrets of success. Welcome to the Private Equity Podcast with Alex Rawlings. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Private Equity Podcast. Joining us today is Sean Mooney, the founder and current chief executive of Blue Wave and former partner and long-term private equity investor. Thank you very much for joining us today, Sean, and sharing your insights. Alex, thank you for having me. So, Sean, for those of us who are not sure who you are or not sure who Blue Wave is, please give us a usual 60, 90-second breakdown of you. Great. Uh, so, Alex, my name is Sean Mooney. I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Wave. Um, I have a bit of a, uh, a long tail that got me here. So I grew up in, in Texas, went to college in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, had really no idea what I was going to do with my life as I was graduating. And so I asked all my friends what they were going to do. And they said, well, we're going to go do investment banking. As a kid who grew up in Texas, my next question was, what's investment banking? And so they said, well, we do this, you know, buy and sell things. I said, okay, that sounds good. I'll go do that. And so from there, I entered the world of investment banking, joining a financial restructuring group in the 90s. Uh, and uh, I, I could have sworn there's no way 120 hours a week would have meant 120 hours a week, but they were, they were accurate. And so for the next few years, I built all sorts of character. Um, from there, I, I I think very much appreciated the industry, but I always also appreciate that I grew up in a family business. So my childhood was working in the back of manufacturing plants and, and doing things that uh, you know really helped build businesses. And so I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to be able to get a little bit closer to actually building companies uh, versus advising them? And so uh, there I heard about this industry called the private equity industry and thought, this sounds great. You actually get to actually build companies and participate in the growth and help other people succeed. So I joined that industry. Uh, and then, you know, years and years later, um, went from uh, one firm to another, became a partner at a fund, and ultimately saw a problem that, uh, that I had myself that needed to be solved. That problem was essentially what led to Blue Wave. Um, and it was this idea that as a business builder, whether you're a CEO or a private equity investor, um, or anything in between, you need today to use lots and lots of third parties. Now, particularly as a private equity investor, every need is different because every company that you're looking at is different. Every company that you invest in is different. And if you're a CEO, it's, it's the same thing. You have unique needs that change from year to year. I could go to Yelp for restaurants. I could go to Amazon for consumer products. I could go to Angie's List for my house. I had nowhere to go for business needs that were higher end or anything above a logo. And so I said, well, why isn't there a Angie's List meets Amazon meets Gartner for the business world, for the private equity world? Because the way I'm solving it now is I have Ivy League grads who are Googling problem in industry and calling buddies at fantastic rates per hour <laughs> that would cause my mind to explode. And I said, well, why isn't there this? And I said, well, I know how to solve this. I'm investing in companies that solve this exact problem every day. If I take a few of these business models and put them together, we solve them. So that became Blue Wave. And so what Blue Wave does is we work with more than 500 of the world's top private equity funds. We connect them with the exact third party resources they need at the exact time they need them across their landscape of due diligence and value creation and preparing for sale needs. And so we're kind of like a bat phone for a business. I like that. I saw a challenge and, and uh, moved across in it. So, um, so Sean, thanks for that um, introduction and uh, and sharing a bit about your profile there. So, what what's the one mistake you either see private equity firms making or portfolio companies making, and what actions would you take to correct them, please? Yeah. So, there's there's a number of things. In, in when I when I say mistakes, I would say it's it, it's you know kind of in this mindset of mine, at least areas for improvement. And I'll personalize it myself. And so if I looked at my former self, where could I have improved? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges in the private equity industry is that there is a huge penalty for failure. 
if you think about the venture capital industry, it's almost celebrating kind of failure. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean that it, negatively, but they're, they're encouraged to take extreme risk and if they can make money three out of 10 times, that's great. The private equity industry you know, is, is really rewarded and frankly, the best asset class in the world, arguably, because it's a very consistent return with very regular expected values of outcomes. And so as a result, they don't take risk or stray from, you know, the norm. And that, I think, worked reasonably well during most of the history of private equity industry because there was room in the returns to kind of do the normal. Right now, what's happening in the industry is there is you know, hyper competition. There are thousands of funds. There's trillions of dollars of capital being put to work. The industry is evolving in some ways, because it needs to. Um, and certainly when I was in the industry, you know, I would choose safety over, over risk. And, and I think that's something that it, to this day quite pervasively happens in the industry because that's the entire history of the industry is two to three times your money with high consistency every time. And that's great. And investors love that. It's great for um, pension funds. It's great for everyone that kind of puts their money in those things, but the industry is evolving and, and, uh, because the economic reality is maturing there. And so when I was in private equity, I would usually go with the name, the big brand that, you know, you never got fired for, you know, hiring IBM kind of a cliche way back when, because if something went wrong, I could stand behind the brand and say, I don't know what happened. I used XYZ firm. The reality was they weren't the best group that I needed. They were kind of a generalist firm that got me generalist results. But in the world of, of private equity, beta doesn't work anymore. It, you need alpha, you need differentiation, you need edge, you need insights. You need something that everyone else doesn't see in that investment banker's book that gets priced into the market. And so one of the biggest things that I would have done and something that I appreciate at Blue Wave seeing thousands of projects of years, a year with hundreds of funds is the value specialization. You bring in a group that is really good at doing what they do and focused and specialized on that so that they're seeing something that no one else does that gives or would have given my former self an edge in a process. And then being able to do that, not only on the diligence side, but also on the value creation side. Because I still would have had today, if I were in the industry, no room for error, but I had to do more. And so I, I would say the number one thing is you specialize groups that see things differently, that bring expertise that maybe generalist groups that cover an entire functional area or cover an entire industry don't otherwise do. I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, obviously running a business myself, finding supplies is incredibly difficult. And, you know, it makes me think back. The first CRM that I put into the business was just atrocious and it was yeah. really well marketed. Um, it was on loads and loads of podcasts. It was actually funny enough, a podcast that I heard it on. And um, I was like, oh, this is, this is amazing. And I was like, this is great. And then three months in and I'm like, oh my God, I need to change CRM. <laughs> And, and I'm like, Christ. Um, so, and in the recruitment industry, CRMs are very difficult uh, to come by that are good. There's the main market leaders, none of which I think are any good. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one, but uh, finding anything supply wise can be, can be incredibly difficult. So um, I think that's a great way to, to look at things. Um, before we jump into a bit more about kind of blue wave and, and the challenges and things, what do you miss? Because, you know, I, I I've, I've said it quite a few times actually now, so it's not as uncommon as you'd think, but seeing people go from private equity investor to business owner, um, I would say is uncommon, but we've had quite a few people now, albeit I think it's only three or four uh, on the podcast. So it is, you're quite a rare beast, um, <laughs> but we seem to be finding them pretty well. What do you miss about the private equity industry? Um, how many times have you thought, nah, do you know what? I do miss doing that bit. Yeah, I think I think few people like me have been crazy enough to leave the industry. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, I think most of my friends in the industry thought I was absolutely nuts when I when I spun out to chase kind of a childhood dream to start a company. Um, the one thing that I think I really missed was it, it, it's a it's a fascinating business. You get to look at hundreds of companies a year and impact you know five to ten a year. 
And so this idea, if you're a curious person, there's no more interesting industry in the world because you get to learn about different things every day and then put your put your metal to the test and try to build something and create a company into today that it was never really intended to be. And so if you're a curious person and a tinkerer who likes to kind of build things and figure out how things work, there is no better industry. And if you're someone who feels like you're in service to others, you know, the really the, the whole job in private equity is to make others successful. And so the only way you're successful is if you are able to kind of see things that others don't and then build a company in a fundamental way that the thing was never intended to be. And that's going to make everyone at that company successful, investors successful. And if you do all of that for 10 years across 10 companies, you know, in, with a lot of delayed gratification, you get to be successful too. And so it's this whole notion of curiosity and competition and service to others that all comes together in this really unique way. As a founder of a company, I get to do that in N equals one capacity. But as a uh, as a private equity investor, you get to do that across, you know, you know, on the assessment side, hundreds of companies, but then tens of companies over time. Imagine that's uh, it's a little bit different, but you know I wouldn't go any. I'm I'm not been a private equity investor as you'd probably guess, but um, yeah, I think running a business is is much more uh, much more exciting. But each to their own, obviously. So having having been on both sides of the table with regards to private equity and now running a uh, you know in essence a, a company um, or portfolio companies we'd see it. Um, what what advice would you give to private equity executives and investors? to better connect, engage, and work with their kind of portfolio uh, senior leadership team? Yeah. The, the private equity industry, as we discussed, is many ways fascinating, but it's also an industry that is a pressure pot. And so as I thought about my time there, you know, you're constantly trying to figure things out. And this is the flip side of the coin that I think a lot of people don't see. The, the private equity investors are you know, in, in an intense competitive environment where 99 out of 100 times they, they lose, if you think about the deal process. The CEOs are in that same pressure intense environment, but it's kind of an equal single company capacity. And so one of the things that, you know, I think gets lost in that industry is everyone's under this tremendous pressure. And if something goes wrong, whether it's the investor or the CEO, their lives can be forever changed for the good or bad. And so what happens is I think in, in the, from my perspective, if I look at my former self now also being a business you know, builder and a CEO myself is I, I've learned that you know, kind of open communication and expectation setting is so critical. And particularly in, per, in intense pressure environments, people tend to put their heads down and say, we're gonna get it done at all costs and take that hill. And if I were to look at in my former self, I'd say, I wish I was better at kind of having open communication with our CEOs and saying, here's the pressure I'm feeling. Here's the expectations that I have. Here are the metrics that I'm going to measure you against. And we're going to do this together, though. So my metrics are your metrics. Your metrics are my me metrics. And we're going to build this thing together in a way that's going to be amazing. But what's critical to this is that we both have free form communication. I think so often... If I looked at my former self, it gets lost in between. It, you know, people don't share, they don't flip their cards up and say, here's what I'm being held against and measured. Here's what you're being held and measured. Here's how they align together. If, if they're able to do that, it makes life so much easier. It, one of the, one of the uh, I think the great phrases I borrowed from my, my former partners was, turn your cards face up. Where we found that if you just kind of flip them face up and you show people your cards, say, this is what I'm dealing with. Let's see yours. Then how do we play the hand so both of us win? It makes such a difference. I think it's amazing how much of in business and life in general just comes down to simple communication and being able to position things, dropping egos, dropping agendas, and just being like, look, we're all in this together. Let's go for it. Um, I've been amazed certainly running a business of how transparent, the more transparent you are, the easier things get. Um, and people understand things better. Um, okay, so you obviously faced quite a few challenges when you're at Blue Wave, uh, when you're at um, uh, in private equity that inspired you to start uh, kind of Blue Wave, and you kind of touched a little bit on that. But what were some of the main challenges that you faced 
that you that inspired you to start Blue Wave and, and start this different business venture? The primary reason that led me to Blue Wave was solving my own problem. And one of the biggest challenges that I faced was that the industry meaningfully matured over time. And when I started 20 something years ago in private equity, we would essentially be able to, you know, buy a company from a business owner directly at a fair price. We would do a couple things to optimize the business. And then we would sell the company in a competitive, efficient process using one of our former investment banker friends. And so it was more about optimization and an arbitrage that was driving returns. And then when I fast forwarded into the, into the kind of the current climate, I was book number 250 in a highly investment bank process that was um, you know, not only facing private equity firms, but strategic buyers. And if I were frank and honest with myself when I would win, an auction where I'd be 250 other bidders, I'd have a heart palpitation. <laughs> I'd go, dear God, we won. <laughs> I hope we have the edge that we convinced ourselves that we did. And and so it was it was kind of crazy. And it became it went from optimization to transformation. And in order to transform a business, that means we could we had to be very right on the due diligence and even better on the value creation. And what that meant was we had to use lots and lots of very good third parties because most private equity firms themselves are small businesses and we're looking at different companies every day. So there's no way you could build all the skill sets that you need internally. And so we're in some ways very uh, kind of, you know, amazing general contractors. You know, you have to bring all these different skill sets and you're going to do the lands different each time. And you're going to, you know, sometimes you can build on, sometimes you can't, but what you can build on is different each time. The challenge was because every company was different. Every need was different. Every third party need was different if we were going to do it right. And then what I would do is you get very expensive MBAs and highly capable people. And we would Google problem in industry and call friends every day and say, do you know someone who does this? And I ran the hourly cost of our team and it was in the thousands of dollars an hour. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we're spending you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week calling you know, people and Googling. And then I called probably 20 to 30 of my other friends at 20 to 30 other funds. So is this how you do it? I said, yeah, that's how we do it. <laughs> it's like, this is insane. <laughs> how can this be the best way to do it? And I said, well, there's nothing else. There's nothing else there for it. We can't build it in. And I, so I tried to build what Blue Wave was internally in the fund. And the challenge was we didn't have enough volume because these were long tails of episodic needs. And so then it struck me. It's like, well, if we were able to build something as, as kind of like a central magic toolbox, it would solve the problem for everyone um, in a way that's also... Um, supportive of the industry because these are the tactics. Right? The, if we stick with the building analogy, I felt like I was the architect, I was the developer, but I, you know, didn't, you know, I needed to know who the right tile person was, or the landscaper, or the pool person, etc. Um, but I didn't care if other people used that person too, because it was really my 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 grand plan and my architecture that that mattered. And so it was this idea that if we could make the world a smaller place, it would be a huge benefit to the private equity firms, but also to the service providers. And, you know, one, one of the stories that struck me when I first did this was, or when I was thinking about it, was a, one of my friends who was a service provider called me and said, Sean, you're, you're on fire all the time. And I sell, I sell fire extinguishers, and, but you're too busy to put yourself out unless I call you. At the exact same time, you're on fire, and my fire extinguisher puts out the one that's literally burning your ankles at the time. Otherwise, you won't ever pick up my phone. And I thought about it. It's like, you're right, because I've got 100 fires around me at every one time. It's not that I don't want to know you. It's just I've got a, I've got a triage or my, my, my shoes are burning right now. <laughs> so, and so this idea that you could understand this universe and bring really good together with really good at the exact time they need each other, know each other in an excellent way. And I go, wow, that solves my problem. <laughs> so, is it... 
Makes makes perfect sense. I think, yeah, as I said earlier, it's it's so difficult finding the right suppliers and and supporting that. And I think it's great that you've created a network of specialists within private equity to be able to give people. And obviously, you've got firsthand experience and knowledge of it, uh, which I think is a is a key uh, certainly a key differentiator. What what advice would you give to private equity firms that are obviously going through these challenges? And yeah, you know, it's the same for us when we reach out to PE firms. You're either hiring or you don't want to speak to us. Um, in simplistic terms. So what advice would you give to private equity firms um, of finding that kind of best in class resources to help them achieve, obviously, ultimately uh, their goals? So I think to use the analogy that, um, that that's very current right now in recruiting, right? The private equity industry has adopted a scorecard methodology for people. And I think very successfully so. And it's and I think it's a great progression in the industry versus interviewing someone who looks and sounds like you and and and, and hire someone you like. It's let's be objective, let's look at the cases we need, let's look at the the attributes and skills we need um, for people. And that's why I think that the the industry as a whole has been tremendously much more successful, at least than it has been historically. Um, the same thing is how they should look at service providers. It's not, do they do something? Do they do recruiting or do they do Lean Six Sigma or do they do Salesforce effectiveness? It's do they do it across the whole host of variables that are very specific to your exact need? And so can they do it across the, you know, multiple variables that are critical to the success of the product or the offering or the service? And that's exactly the way that we do at Blue Wave. Every single project is scored and rated and calibrated against a multi-dimensional scorecard. And so I think part of the reason we've been so um, successful as we, as we have is because we're, we're doing exact with exact and it's lock and key. And we're doing it at the speed of business at the private equity standard. But that's the reason why, you know, the only way you can increase outcomes is the same way they've been able to improve the outcomes of hiring people. The same thing with service providers. They should take that same approach, looking for specialization, alignment of attributes across a range of variables versus they do this and they do it for a lot of other people and have a lot of, you know, logos. Yeah, there's quite a few of the big, and um, we do any kind of small and mid-cap type uh, firms, but uh, I spoke to one of the big boys in um, in private equity, one that every single person uh, would uh, would know, whether you, well, if you know anything about private equity, this is one of the big names. And uh, there was, uh, there was, I was talking to their head of, uh, head of talent, and um, he was uh, saying about their success rate with the big four executive search firms. Um, and uh, they had less than, uh, I think it was, sorry, it was around 33 or 32 percent success rate on uh, on searches. And I was just like, why why are you using them? And they were like, because they're the big firms, we're the big firm, and therefore that's who we use. And yep. I was like, but they're not doing what you need them to do. So it's kind of one of them. You never get fired by doing by IBM. But I suppose if you don't know where to look um, and uh, you know you don't want to be the person who gets blamed for trying something different and not working out, whereas you'd rather just be happy with it not working out in the first place uh, and looking at that. So uh, I think it's a good uh, good intermediary uh, to be able to offer. And I think that's that's an excellent point, Alex. And you know, one of the things that we see is the big private equity firms are realizing that you can't, you know, you get beta and you don't have room in the returns for beta anymore. And so every day we get calls from the big private equity firms who are looking for specialists in recruiting and everything, because they say, you know what, we need someone who can align across those variables. And on the people front, that was my experience too. I used a big name firm and they were probably, a, their networks really didn't align with my needs. And they had, if I needed a, a, someone who could run a billion dollar company, they would have been great. But I had a $200 million company <laughs> and it's a different person and a different industry and a different geography. And so the big firms can be really good at what they do in, in spots, right? And, and, and just like any company can. Um, and so to your point, I think the reason why you all have been successful as well is because you're focusing on uh, a size of company and different areas of companies. And they realize that you're going to bring alpha versus beta uh, with a lot, networks that are aligned for the needs of your customers. Seeing a lot of what we see in private equity, the more firms that go more niche and more specialist, 
and aren't going, yeah, we invest small to large, not too many small to large cap, but we invest across every industry in every sector across all of Europe and North America. It's, it's too broad. It's too big. And you don't, you need to, uh, you know, channel where your network and where your connections are and where you can help. So it's the same with, uh, with any industry. So one of my favorite questions is obviously about talent. What three attributes do you believe make a top performer? That's a great question. I will, I, what I would say um, of the three that are, that are most important, one, intelligence, but intelligence has diminishing returns. I think you have to be smart enough. Yeah, but, but, but after that, there's kind of a level and then it levels off. And maybe that's just because I'm saying that to myself because I've never been the smartest guy in the room in a, in a room full of really smart people. <laughs> so, that makes two of us. I'm probably projecting on myself. Um, the other one I would say is grit or tenacity in the face of adversity, the ability to be determined and plow through and kind of never give up. And then the last one I would say is being a good listener. I think as a top individual performer, that's not important, but as a top leader, you have to be a very good listener because the reality is you're going to be much better because of your team um, than the superpowers of yourself. Last one's definitely something I had to work on. I was very good at talking. Um, <laughs> well. So good at listening. Um, as uh, my uh, old uh, CEO pointed out, you've got two ears and one mouth. Use it in that order. Um, <laughs> so uh, very, very, very good advice uh, from him. What, um, what do you love about the private equity industry? And equally, what do you dislike about it? What I love about the private equity industry is the ability to kind of build things, make things better, make them you know, more interesting, add value, provide more jobs, uh, you know, build something that's going to last in an industry. If you looked at the old, you know, the reputation of the private equity industry, I think particularly if you go back to like the 80s or 90s, the reputation was they, they cut costs and they, you know, you know, let people go and, and it's really more about cutting things. Today, and whether it's through altruism or selfish altruism, it's really about building things and making companies better and turning them into something they never were intended to be. And I think that's something that you see in the industry today. If you were to take a, you know, an honest appraisal of it, you know, it's a, it's it's a huge part of the global economy and it's a huge creator of jobs in some ways because it has to. That's the reality of the economic situation. It's Econ 101. But it is what it is. And so what I really love about the industry is the fact that you, you get to, to do those things, to transform something, to tinker. Anyone who is a kid like to take things apart or played with Legos or, you know, or, or kind of built sandcastles or forts in the woods, yeah, you know, this is an industry that's built for them. <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of this, this great fun thing. Um, and so that was probably the, the biggest thing that drew me to it and, and kept me interested in it for so many years. Um, the, I, I think the, the thing that I, 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 I didn't enjoy is the reality of the industry. It's, it's, a, it's intensely pressure filled. It's a, it's a business that's result oriented. It's something where you look at the people in this industry, you know, they're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I, I would bring the job home with me every day. Most vacations, I would, you know, leave halfway through to go see a company. And so that balance is a little bit off. And, but it comes with rewards, but it is, a, it is a sacrifice to succeed in it because of the competitive intensity and the nature of probably the entire industry is filled with kind of type A or a type A. I, I would always call myself a type, type A minus person. And, <laughs> and, but you know, so that there's, a, there's two sides to that coin where it, you can do these great things, but to succeed, it, you know, the tenacity, the grit, you know, it's filled with an industry of curious, tenacious, <laughs> hardworking people. And so, it, you know, it, it, one comes without the other or one doesn't come without the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I tend to find is anybody in business related private equity or anything really has, you know, influences, well-read, watch certain things. Where do you get your influences from? Yeah. 
Um, I, I'd say the, the first one is really my dad. I grew up in a, in a family business. And so, you know, my, my, my Saturdays and, and Sundays were often going to work with them. And I'd go and, and uh, you know, play in the office and probably, you know, they would always wonder where all their office supplies went, you know, and people would come back on Monday. Um, and then, you know, when I was old enough, they put me in the back of the, the plant. And uh, I was very, I became very expert at painting things safety yellow. That was my job. And I think to this day, I have nightmares about it. And they would uh, come up with all sorts of amazing, uh, you know, jobs for me that, uh, that required, uh, I think, tremendous uh, work ethic and <laughs> determination. I think there was a plant level bonus for whomever came up with the, uh, the worst job for me. My, my last job of my first year in the plant, and this is in the Texas heat, it's 110 degrees. They gave me 50 bags of cement and walked it to the far corner of this property, hand mixed it and uh, poured this, this uh, slab of cement in this corner. Um, and they said it was very important. It's going to be used for something. And I ended up going back there 15 years ago. And the only thing on that slab of cement are my initials. And so, <laughs> so, but it was a great lesson. You know, it's this idea that not only you have to work hard, but you respect the people who do that, the hard work as well. And so that was one of the best life lessons I had. Um, and then the whole idea of, if, of, I've always said, I kind of follow the Walmart form of innovation. And so it's, it's read, you know, and learn from others. I'm not the most innovative person, but I can, I can observe how things work and combine them together. And, and that's been, you know, I, I think it, <laughs> one of my, one of my, my uh, colleagues at my former fund called me successful in, in spite of myself. And so, <laughs> so I think that's because I'm able to kind of see things and learn from others. And so I try to read as much as possible. You know, there's, there's a number of books that I pass out to everyone here um, that I think are, are really impactful. Uh, books like Good to Great, um, The Lean Startup, Who Moved My Cheese, uh, the, the Goal. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I try to, to learn from from others every day, but then also hopefully impart that on some of the people that we work with here as well. Oh, very good books. I'm a big reader myself. And yeah, we, uh, we push out. Not everybody's a reader in audio books and uh, you know, YouTube's a great uh, platform and everything else that comes with it. But uh, yeah, we do try and push out as much as we can. Um, the more, well, I was told a uh, great quote. I can't remember who, who uh, originally said it, but the, uh, the more you read, the less you know. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. And now I read a lot and I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, that does make complete sense. Um, but uh, widens, the, uh, widens the horizons. So Sean, well, thank you very much for joining us. If anybody wants to reach out uh, and uh, get in touch with you, Sean, how best uh, do they do so, please? So if you go to our website, www.bluewave.net, that's B-L-U-W-A-V-E.net. There's no E in the blue. The E was taken. And so that's part of the secret to it. We're not, we're not doing a cool name. It's a practical one. <laughs> um, but if you go there, there's contact information and there's a way to directly access me if, if, uh, if helpful. Perfect. We'll put that in the show notes. So if you are uh, getting hitting the wrong website, then uh, please do uh, check the show notes and we'll get that. So, well, thank you very much for joining us, Sean. Really appreciate your insight. Uh, you leave us lots of value and really interesting to hear about that kind of different from the private equity world and long-term investor and then moving into running your own shop and having your, uh, you know, your, uh, your bit of fun, as I would describe it, as growing your own business. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. If there's anything we can do to be helpful to you or any of your listeners, please let us know. Absolutely. And as always, thank you very much to everybody listening and for joining us today. Should you ever need support with your private equity or portfolio executive hiring, please do reach out to me at Raw Selection. And if you haven't done so, please do subscribe to the podcast and you'll be notified of the next one that comes out every two weeks. But till the next time, keep smashing it. And thanks a lot for listening. Thank you for listening to the Private Equity Podcast on www.raw-selection.com.